Hey everyone, and welcome back to Global Healthy Lifestyle Events. In this episode, we'll be celebrating the holidays with a dairy-free panna cotta dessert from our creaky kitchen, Chef Chantel, and we'll also be joined by physical therapist, Dr. Chad Woodard, who will be sharing with us simple exercises and stretches that may help us make some New Year's resolutions that are more fitting for the chronic illness lifestyle. So you can find the recipe in the description below, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Well, Chantal, I heard it was pretty chaotic trying to find those ingredients, was it? Hello, everyone. Yes, I certainly did have quite the adventure today. So between myself and my husband, we ended up at three different stores, actually four because I went to the bodega on the corner as well. And um, in researching this recipe, I learned a lot about coconuts and what they produce. So just briefly... um, I went to the store looking for coconut cream and I ended up with this. It says coconut cream, right? You know, this is something totally different. It has a ton of sugar in it. Great for making pina coladas, not great for baking. I also ended up with this evaporated coconut milk, super liquidy, just like regular evaporated milk. Also not what we're looking for, for this recipe. I had in my, in my pantry, unsweetened coconut milk. Found out this is not what we want for this recipe because it separates. The top of this is going to have a layer of coconut oil and then the coconut milk is below and you either shake it to combine or use the oil for frying. It's a whole thing, but this is also not what we need. I had to send my dear sweet husband, thank you, hon, to two stores, one that said they had it and then another one that also said they had it, but they actually did. And he found what we were looking for, which is coconut cream. And this will not separate. It is what is widely recommended for this recipe. So that's what we're going with today is unsweetened coconut cream. Okay, so let's jump into what we're going to need for this recipe. Like I said, we're going to need the coconut cream. Um, We're going to need some honey for sweetness. We're going to be using gelatin. Um, Every one of these packets is one and a one and a half teaspoons, I believe. It's about a a quarter ounce. Um, And we're going to need some homemade vanilla. You can use store bought vanilla if you like, but I made this special for Creaky Kitchen, so really excited to use that. And then we'll be just going with a little bit of water and a pinch of salt. So I will toss it to Corey, who will be able to give you guys all on one screen, so you can screenshot it all of the ingredients and the precise measurements. So Corey, if you could help me out with that, that'd be great. Thanks so much. Thanks Chantel. For a quick list of the ingredients, here we go. You're gonna need a quarter cup of water, a teaspoon and a half of gelatin. You're gonna need one 13 and a half ounce can of unsweetened coconut cream and make sure it's not cream of coconut. Those are two different things. You're gonna need a third of a cup of maple syrup or honey one teaspoon of vanilla extract, and a pinch of salt. Now, back to Chantel. Thanks so much, Corey. Really appreciate that. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by blooming the gelatin. And what that is, is you're going to take a small amount of water. In this case, it's a quarter cup of cool water. It's not icy cold, but it is cool. Um, It's freezing back here at the the side of my house, so didn't have to do much for that. Um, and then we're going to take our packet of gelatin. Like I said, this is one and a half teaspoons of gelatin or a quarter ounce. Um, and we're going to sprinkle it over the water. And from here is when you kind of have to start getting things in motion because the longer you let gelatin sit, the harder it becomes. And it goes from being a thickener to being, I don't know what the word is, cement, (laughs) So I'm just going to whisk this so that it's evenly distributed. And we're going to just set that over here to the side. So right now our timer is going. I'm going to open up our coconut cream and we're going to get that into a shallow pan. And while that heats up, this will be activating. Hey Chantel, it's Zoe. I've got a question for you. 
So in this recipe, I know that you're using gelatin and the raw material for gelatin is animal body parts, if I'm correct. So my question is for you, are there any alternatives to gelatin or perhaps a vegan version of it? So that's a great question. And in researching this recipe, yes, I did find alternatives. Um, the one that a lot of people go to is arrowroot. That is actually not a good alternative for this. Um, for some reason, it just doesn't gel properly. Um, but what does is agar agar flakes. I may be mispronouncing that, and I apologize to the community if I am. Um, but they can be used almost interchangeably, and they are vegan. Um, the other thing that uh, was noted by a lot of different people that have made this is to use the agar agar flakes and not the powder. Um, like with this gelatin, this is a powder that becomes a gel. The agar agar flakes apparently do something different. If you guys try that and you can report back, that would be great because I don't have much experience using them. Actually, probably haven't used them for 20 years. So um, if you guys want to let me know if you try this recipe and you use agar agar flakes, I'd love to know what, what happens. So this is just going to come up to a boil. It'll take like three or four minutes. This gelatin has already gelled really, really well. Actually, I'm very, very shocked because nothing like this ever works out for me. <laughs> so the gelatin is going to bloom for about five minutes. And in the same time, we have added uh, one can of the coconut cream to our saucepan. And it's at medium, medium high heat. I'm also going to add about a half a cup of honey. I might add a little bit less only because I'm not really big on sweet sweets. So I'm going to go a little bit shy, probably about a third. Yikes. And we're just going to pour that in so that it gets all married and everything melts at the same time. Also at this time, I'm going to go ahead and add in a little bit of nutmeg. This is not part of the traditional recipe, but it is that time of year, and I thought that it might be a nice little addition. I feel like anytime I'm doing anything creamy, even if it's a savory dish, I always end up adding just a little bit of nutmeg, even in my lasagna. So I'm just gonna grate a little bit of lasagna, um, a little bit of lasagna, a little bit of nutmeg over top. It's probably gonna end up being less than a quarter of a teaspoon. Um, and that's just for a nice little warm flavoring. And then the last thing, last two things I'm going to add, this is that vanilla that I started with you guys a couple of years ago and, um, got my inspiration from Ina Garten, who's had the same vanilla bottle for like 30 years. You just get vanilla pods, fill it up to the top with good vodka and let it sit for six months. And this one has been going for almost two years now. And it's just, it's invaluable. If you don't make your own vanilla, you can just get store-bought, that's fine. So I'm gonna add about a teaspoon of that in. And then I'm gonna add a pinch of salt. Buy a pinch of salt, because salt wakes up your taste buds. So adding a pinch of salt to sweet things is really, really helpful. So we're just going to stir this all together, make sure that it is coming together. We want to bring it just to the boil and then take it off. And that takes about the same time as this gelatin takes to, to bloom. So for a matter of timing, five minutes with the gelatin, five minutes on the boil, I mean on the, on the hob. And once it comes up to a boil, I see a couple of bubbles coming up, one, two, three, four. And then once it comes up to the bubble, I'm shutting it off. I'm putting it on the back burner, literally. And then I'm going to start whisking in about half of this in so that it gels up. And then I'll do the other half. So we, a watch pot never boils, but I've got three cameras watching it plus me. So of course it's not boiling. Okay. <laughs> and why am I whisking? I'm whisking because I don't want it to separate. Um, even though coconut cream is, uh, it's semi-homogenous. You have to kind of nudge it a little bit. So 
that is up to the boil. Off the burner, recap your honey so that you don't spill it all over the kitchen. Personal experience. And now I'm going to check notes. A little bit of a brain fog day, so I do have to check notes today. <laughs> so I'm going to pour a small amount over the bloomed whisk well till it looks smooth and then add the rest. Ooh, moment of truth. It's working you guys. And I know this is probably horrible for the sound department. Sorry. I'll try and be quiet. But that is all whisked in, looks very smooth. We'll go ahead and add in the rest. And you'll notice with the whisk, very small motions, not trying to add a lot of air, just trying to make sure, oh my goodness, that smells really good. Um, just trying to make sure that everything gets very well incorporated. Fantastic. And I haven't made a mess out of my kitchen counters. So <clears throat> I don't have ramekins. I lost them in a move or they're in a box somewhere. So what we're going to do, I'm going to let this not really cool, but I'm going to give it a second. And then we're going to be pouring it into, this is a silicone baking mold. Um, and this will make it easy for us to pop them out when they're totally chilled. Then the other alternative I have, I like small desserts, very, very petite desserts because I don't eat them a lot, don't eat a lot of sweets. So I have little tiny teacups. I don't know why I have this set. It was my dad's. And when you invert them, they could go like so, or you can serve it with the teacup, put whatever your compote topping, uh, different berries, whatever you like, and then you can see it. And it's a very pretty presentation. So we'll be doing both. Okay, so time for a quick survey of you guys. And remember, uh, the answers are anonymous. You'll get something that'll pop up on your screen. You can go ahead and add your answer. But what we wanted to know is how do you handle your triggers? Or actually, sorry, what are your triggers? And especially around the holidays, we're faced with a lot of gluten, a lot of dairy, a lot of sugar, alcohol, all kinds of things, chocolate for some people. So we'd like to know what are your triggers that may cause a flare or just cause you just not to feel as good as you possibly could, let us know. Did you have another question for me? It's Zoe, I have another question for you. So why is this dessert a good recipe for the holidays, especially for those who have some food intolerances? Why is this a great recipe for the holidays, especially for me and other people who are daily, dairy intolerant? Well, number one, there is no dairy involved. So that's a, that's a plus. Um, I also, sugar is not so much of a trigger for me, but it's something that I really can't process too well, sugar, sweet, stuff like that. So this being light on the sugar is really, really good for me. Um, and again, like I said, as far as dairy is concerned, that's like basically a no go for me. So I look for alternatives all the time and I know a lot of us do. Um, and we're really at a good time in, in a way because we've got so many different alternatives to dairy available to us that just weren't available 10 years ago or even 15 years ago. So I say that as I'm filling these up. Um, that's why it's a great recipe for me. And I think it'll be a good addition for folks if they've never tried to do a panna cotta. Um, this is just a great introduction into the gelatin or, um, I don't know, a different type of a creamy dessert. So we had just enough with the one can of coconut cream, the slightly shy of half a cup of honey, our vanilla, our pinch of salt, and our nutmeg. We had just enough mixture to fill four of these silicone molds, which are much bigger, they're good dessert size, and two of my little teacups. So let me go ahead and show you that.
So what happens next is I let these cool a little bit on the counter and then I make space in my refrigerator because there's none right now. <laughs> I make space in the refrigerator and I put them at the lowest level of the fridge flat to make sure that they set up. And these take six hours to overnight to set. Um, I'm probably going to set them overnight and then we'll come back and take a look at what they look like. I'm also going to top them with a couple of things. Got some delicious fresh mint, organic. And I went out and got this wonderful little, I think this is a pint or a half pint of raspberries. And I thought the combination of those two would go great for this time of year. So these are gonna go into the refrigerator overnight. And then tomorrow morning, I'm gonna take them out. And you're gonna, just like when you were a kid with Jello, if you had that as a child, um, it'll wiggle and it'll be firm. You'll be able to tell that it's gone from its liquid to its solid. Um, and to unmold these, uh, this I'm lucky because it's in a little bit of a dish. So I'm just going to pour some warm water into the dish until I see a little bit of water form around the, the outside of this. And then I know that it's melted a little bit so I can go ahead and unmold it. Same thing with the teacups. I'll go ahead and stick them in a little bit of warm water. I'll have a cup with some warm water and then I will invert them. Well, maybe, yo, oh, yep. I filled these up too high. So I'm going to invert them onto their little, uh, their little saucers. And that's how those two will go. So pretty easy unmolding. Um, and they usually come out perfectly whole. They don't crack for the most part, fingers crossed. And, um, yeah, you just want to make sure that you use a simple mold. Um, or cup in order to, to get them to come out easier. If you use something like I was going to use a little, the mini bunt pans, bad idea. So really, really simple to unmold. And then I will film tomorrow myself unmolding these. And for me, it'll be overnight, but for you guys, it'll be in just a few minutes. So over to you guys, Zoe and Corey. Thank you so much. Those little teacups are so cute. I can't wait to see how they turn out. That looks so fun, especially if you're hosting guests over for the holidays. I love the individual portion. So I can't wait to see that. In the meantime, though, we'll share the survey one results. Okay, here we have them. It looks like sugar is the biggest trigger for this group or other. I'm I'm curious like what people have for other if they want to put it in the chat. I think I saw processed foods, but you know, for me actually all of these at some point or another have been a trigger, but I I agreed in that sugar is the number one for me, but it's so hard to get myself to avoid it. And I'm really grateful Chantel taught us a dessert tonight that's lower in sugar so we can still enjoy in it. Um, and then before we see the results of our dessert from Chantel, I just wanted to give a quick little commercial break for the Health Advocates podcast, which I host with my colleague Stephen and um, we recently did a two-part special on non-radiographic axial spondyl arthritis, which was so fun for me to do because I actually live with spondyl arthritis, and I feel like it's one of the forms of arthritis that's less talked about. Whenever I mention it to my family or friends, they say, oh, is that just rheumatoid arthritis? And I spend a lot of time educating. So this was really cool. I got to sit down with um, patient advocate Ricky White, um, policy expert Amanda Ledford, and rheumatologist Dr. Stark, and we got to have a great conversation about the challenges around diagnosis, um, around afford access to affording um, treatment and the different policy changes that are happening around the states and federally to hopefully help people gain better access to care and treatment. So as you can see here, there's two parts of the episode and you can go to that URL. I'll also drop a link in the chat. And I thought it'd be fun to share with you all something I do outside of our virtual events here. And I hope you have a listen and enjoy it. And I will pass it back to Chantel, our pre-recorded Chantel, that we can see the results of those delicious looking panna cottas. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Creaky Kitchen. Um... It's the next day and everything has set up. And unfortunately, the ones that I made in the pink mold, I tried to unmold them, forgot, left them in the hot water for too long and they melted completely. So I'm just gonna show you quickly one of the glass ones that I have done. And that will be the presentation for that. It's very cute and just a little tiny teaspoon. You can go ahead and nosh on that. And then the second one, 
we're gonna hope it unmolds. One, two, three. It's not unmolding. Ah, there it is, perfect. So we're just gonna go ahead and it melted as well a little bit. Well, a lot of bit, oh goodness. So we're gonna go ahead and add a couple of raspberries on top and a little sprig of mint. So there you go, two different ways. Well, one's a success, one's a little bit of a fail, but that's okay. Um, not everything always goes right in the creaky kitchen. That's perfectly fine. I hope you guys do try this recipe because it is actually pretty tasty. And um, yeah, so we'll see you guys next time. Happy holidays and looking forward to seeing you guys again in the creaky kitchen. Take care. Well, that looked delicious and I know what I'm making this weekend for dessert. Um, so let's go back to Chantel. Chantel, before we get to Dr. Woodard, what are some do's and don'ts when it comes to unmolding panna cotta? Okay. Speed is apparently a factor here. Okay. I haven't made these since I was probably in my early 20s and I did not have a show to film while I was making them. So putting them in the water and flipping them out was super easy. I mean, I just get a platter, I mean, even like a sheet tray, flip them out, two seconds, you're in and out. Well, I didn't think that perhaps leaving them in the warm water for a couple of seconds more would make that big of a difference. It did, it made a big difference. And then the other one, the tiny one that I did, um, I unmolded it. And at first it looked perfect. And literally by the time I looked at the camera and then turned to look back, it was like, no, I will not conform. So it was a, it was a little bit of a rebel and that's cool, whatever. It was tasty. Um, the, it, it set off really well with the raspberry and the mint and I made its little friend again, which I just mm -hmm. think I have dropped a piece of mint, but its little friend is right here. So this will be my little dessert later. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that sometimes, uh, things go wrong in the creaky kitchen. Happy accidents, uh, do happen. And, um, we're all very, very lucky that I am not a big sweet eater because I probably would have been devastated. <laughs> um, and nor is my husband. So, um, this was all good. It is still a great recipe. It does still have great merit. And, um, I hope you guys try it. It was really yummy. <laughs> Well, I, I definitely will be trying it. I am a big sweets eater and I force my wife to eat a lot of sweets because I love to make them. So uh, it's it's a tough life she lives. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for, for walking us through all that uh, and for the recipe. And now let's introduce Dr. Chad. Um, Dr. Chad Woodard is joining us today. He's a male pel pelvic health specialist uh, who also is a self-described ultra endurance athlete uh, who runs Ironman competitions and has worked with creaky joints a number of different times on a couple videos. And we're really excited to welcome him here uh, to talk about exercise and stretching. And uh, Dr. Chad, thank you for joining us and uh, take it away. Thank you. Hey, Chantel, if you could just mail a couple of those to New York City, that'd be great because I'm not going to have a happy accident. It's going to be a disaster. Uh, that that was adorable. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, Dr. Chad, hello. Uh, Self-described endurance athlete because it's, it's all a lie. Uh, but I'm really happy to be here. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to come in and chat with you all. And the topic du jour as we are ending uh, this year and coming up towards a new year is what we all love to do is New Year's resolutions. And I've worked with humans and movement for a long time. And so New Year's resolutions are quite a topic. And a lot of people ask, how do you do New Year's resolution? What's the best kind of exercise? What should I do? How do I do it? How do I stick to it? And I am an enablist. I am a relentless optimist. And I say, do it. Do your New Year's resolution. But it's so hard, it's so hard. New Year's resolutions are, are the worst. Uh, I, I can't do them. Uh, I don't know what kind of magical powers people have that do them and stick to them. But I am, however, a big lover, of course, as the intro might imply, a big lover of movement, of any kind of movement. So the, the first thing I'll say is, the best kind of exercise, New Year's or not, the best kind of exercise to do is, the kind you're actually going to do and the kind that you love to do, right? I 
get these questions all the time. Oh, I've heard running is so good for me. Oh yeah, running is great for you. Do you like to run? No, I hate to run. Well, then running is not going to be good for you because you're not going to do it if you hate it. So that's my the, the ridiculous thing that I am now saying is the best kind of exercise is the thing that you can do and that you actually like to do and you actually will do. So if we think of that as it pertains to a New Year's resolution or getting into more movement or more activity, where I come from in my profession is more of not what is the best kind of movement to do, but how can we better prepare somebody to move in a way that they want to move? So if as the year comes around, you think, I want to start a walking program, I would start, like to start some yoga, I want to start some strengthening, I want to dust off that Peloton bike and actually use it now, what, whatever it is, I find that if I can help my patients and myself feel a little bit better or move a little bit better before we go into this kind of movement, then we're more likely to stick to a resolution. Can you dig that? If we can just give you a better foundation, perhaps we're gonna be better off to move in general. So I just wanna talk through a couple of very simple basic things, a couple of stretches that are designed to just help bring your level of how am I feeling today a little bit higher, get a little bit more safe movement so that way whatever exercise it is that you wanna do, you feel a little, better, a little bit better to be able to do it. Word, capiche? Okay, so holidays. Who's stressed out? Oh my God, holidays are so stressful. I feel like this is, yeah, there's some big hands there. Very good. Uh, we, good, we got shoulder exercises there. Well done, everyone that raised your hand. So it's very stressful. We're driving around. We have road rage. We're screaming at each other because it's the holidays. So we're all stressed out. Maybe we're carrying heavy stuff and shopping bags and coconut cream, not to be confused with cream of coconut. And, you know, we're, we got all the heavy stuff. And so our necks, like I, I, I'm a physical therapist. I make a lot of money this time of year because of necks everybody's neck is tight, it can't move. So I just wanna show you a quick neck stretch. You're welcome to do this along with me. I'm gonna do them in real time. Please, as a giant asterisk, no one hurt themselves, even if you feel it's time for you to hurt yourself, don't do it. But you're welcome to kind of do these things with me, but just go gently, don't do it like I do it if it doesn't feel right for you. The first easy neck stretch is for some muscles here in the front of our neck called scalenes and sternocleidomastoid. Don't worry, there's no quiz. It doesn't matter if you heard that. But I just want you to see what it feels like gently for you if you side bend your head to one side or you bring one ear to the, to the shoulder. So right now I'm going left ear to left shoulder. So right now I'm getting a little bit of a stretch which feels kind of lovely. And this one's pretty common. Now, if you keep that side bend action going right there, and then while you are side bent, if you then start to turn your head to look up at the ceiling as though you're saying, what color are my ceilings? Is popcorn ceiling still a thing? That's kind of what you look like right now. So you're keeping that nice side bent neck, very gentle. And then you turn your head and what you may feel is a bit of a stretch kind of in the front part of your neck. You might feel it in the back a little bit, back by the base of your skull. People have tightness in different spots. You're doing great, keep going. The shoulder that you are bending away from, in my case right now, my right shoulder, you're keeping that down away from your ear. So you're not letting that hike up. So you're just side bent and you're rotated and you can kind of flirt around with the angle a little bit. So I'll, I'll show you this whenever our heads are back on straight, but you can kind of tilt your head back a little bit. You can rotate it a little bit more. Ooh, -hoo, baby. I am glad to be doing this presentation because I need this stretch. Now, as you come out of this stretch, go nice and slow. It'll feel a little wonky. You'll see what I mean. As you come out, you see, ooh, Lord, right? There's just a lot that really activates a lot of the nerves. So before we do the other side, so we don't walk around in circles, um, the a couple of things that I was talking about, once we get into that position, we side bend and then we rotate and I just kind of like play around with the angle. Maybe, maybe like that's the right spot for you or no, no, this is the right spot. So feel free to move that around. So yeah, you're side bending now to the opposite side. My right ear is to my right shoulder until I feel a nice stretch in the top of my shoulder. And then I'm going to rotate up and now I'm going to check out that side of the room on the ceiling. And it's so interesting. You might feel a totally different thing you might feel a very different stretch from side to side and that's okay. If you feel any pinching, like a sharp pinching, like you're getting stabbed, I want you to come out of that a little bit. 
There's no prizes for pain. So just a gentle feeling of stretch, lovely. But a sharp stab, not so lovely. So let's just do like 10 more seconds here because it is almost as delicious as a panna cotta. Almost. <laughs> Ooh, I'm melting my mold. Okay, good, come out of that it's nice and slow. Yeah, baby. All right, so now we got heads that move around. One more thing that I just wanna show you, uh, this is gonna be really good if you're getting into uh, some sort of movement that requires more like spine stuff. So we did some neck already. This is gonna be for the middle part of your spine and the lower part of your spine. So the thoracic vertebrae and the lumbar vertebrae all the way down to the pelvis. Same thing, everybody listen to my words really quick. If you have arthritis in your spine or you have some disc issues or whatever, you do this at the, at the level that is good for you. There's no, no extra credit if you go into some sort of like Cirque du Soleil posture experience here. Uh, so just go nice and gentle, yes? So I'm gonna step back a little bit so you can see. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Voila, welcome to my bedroom. Yes, perfect. So I just want you to see what my legs are doing. I'm just going to be in a bit of a stride stance. So my right now, my right leg will be in front of my left leg. So it's just like I'm walking down the street. So that's what my legs are doing. So I just needed to show you that so you know what I'm up to. So one leg is front of the other. For this one, my right leg is standing in front, just like I froze right in, in space as I was walking. You might also want to be near something that you can balance, because I'm going to be doing this one in standing. You can just watch me and make fun of me. I encourage that. But if you want to do it along, we're going to be in standing for this one. And if balance is a little issue, stay next to like a kitchen counter, next to a wall. So that way we don't topple over because nobody enjoys that. So we're standing. Right leg is forward. Now, if my right leg is forward, what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist my breastbone or my sternum towards the right. So again, right leg is forward and I'm gonna twist so my chest is facing towards the right. Again, hang on to something if you feel a little wobbly. All right, so good. <clears throat> Breastbone, chest is facing to the right. And now your head is gonna come back and look towards the left. So think of like, we're like wringing out a towel here. Right leg is forward, chest is facing right, head is facing left. Good. So it's kind of like we're doing a big walk, a very exaggerated walking posture. So I'm going to say all the words again. My right foot is forward. My chest is facing to the right. My head is facing to the left. And we're going to hold that for a bit. Now, what I want you to do while you're in that posture is to find how far can you twist your chest and your trunk? How far can you twist your head? And again, no sharp pains. That's a whammy, no whammies, no sharp pains. I just want a nice feeling of, that's about as far as I feel I can go. Now, once you find, great, that's as far as I feel I can go, stay there. Well done you, don't go anywhere. Now I want you to imagine that I am, in a loving way, gently coming up behind you and I'm grabbing you maybe by the shoulders and I'm trying to untwist you and you're not gonna let me. Maybe I'm up here at the top of your head and I'm trying to twist your head back to center and you're not going to let me. So we're actually adding in a little bit of kind of internal resistance and isometric experience and isometric contraction. So you're still in that posture, facing to the right with your chest, facing to the left with your head, and some creepy guy with tattoos is behind you gently trying to twist you back to normal. And you say, no, creepy man with tattoos, I will not be untwisted, I will hold this position. And in fact, au contraire, I'm gonna actually twist a little bit further. Take that, ooh, and you just eke out another millimeter or two of range of motion. And how's that head? Ooh, that's a nice twist to that direction. And you're teaching that guy just twisting you a lesson and you can now come back to normal and standing. That's a sneaky stretch slash strengthen. So can we do the other side just because I'm a PT and then I promise I'll shush? Is that okay, do I have time? Who's my boss? Okay, I'm getting thumbs up. So I'm You're sorry, here. everybody. You're stuck with me for another two minutes. All right, so uh, last thing, our right leg was forward. Now this time our left leg will be forward. Left leg is forward, right leg is back. Whew. Very good, I'm out of breath. <laughs> That's not good. 
All right, so left leg is forward now. Now you're gonna twist your chest and your whole rib cage towards the left side. And now our head is gonna to twist towards the right. Oh, that's all kinds of interesting tight feelings. So again, I'll say all the words, left leg is forward, twisting the chest and the sternum and the thorax towards the left and the head and the neck twist towards the right. Now you might be feeling all kinds of new interesting places that feel some tightness, that feel the stretch. For me right now, I feel the front of my right hip and my abdominals. I feel my left lower back. I feel my left neck on the back side. I feel all kinds of exciting things. So hold that again, just like I was behind you and I was grabbing you by the shoulders and I was trying to unwind you ever so gently. I want you to create some resistance and not let me pull you back to center. I've got your head, I'm right here by your ears. I'm gently pulling you back to center and you're not gonna let me. And now can you eke out another, just like, just a, a smudgen. I don't know what a smudgen is, but it's a small amount of range of motion. Just eek another degree or two. There you go, teach me a lesson. Here's 10 more seconds. Are you smiling? It's good to smile while you stretch. Three seconds, two seconds, no seconds. Good, and come back to normal. Um, I see a thing, um, what is this thing called? Huh, oh, I don't know. It's, we're gonna call it this, the smidgen stretch because I just made up that word. This is the smidgen stretch for your holidays and for your New Year's resolutions. Thank you for putting up with my nonsense. Thank you so much, Dr. Chad. That was awesome. As someone who has lots of back pain, that stretch felt great right now. So I, I can't wait to do that more. I did see a question in the chat. Are there any easy hip stretches for someone with really tight hips and low flexibility? Ooh, what a tasty question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any easy hip stretches. So there's, hips do lots of really cool things. They're a really mobile joint. So one of the more important ones that I like is going to be uh, some sort of hip extension stretch. So actually how we just started that, uh, forgive my camera angle here, but I'll just back up so people can see hip extension. Or if I was walking down the street and I've got one leg back behind me, hopefully you can see that okay in the camera. It's exactly how we just started the thing we just did of one leg is forward, one is back. And I've just got one leg back here. And while I'm here, if I just give my tailbone or my butt just a little bit of a tuck, like a naughty puppy dog, then that, that's going to be a good hip extension stretch or a stretch for the hip flexors. And that's really important. So that way we have that. And then anything else that's going to gently stretch the inner thighs. So things like that are called like butterfly stretch or um, let's just go with that. A butterfly stretch is fine, but there's quite a few variations, but Anything that you can gently do to get your inner thighs or your adductors, your adductors to stretch are gonna be probably the two slightly more important if I had to pick a couple without knowing you and your body. Thank you, that sounds great. Um, if anyone has a question, please ask it in the chat really quickly. Um, we'll try to get to them uh, before we say goodbye to Dr. Chad. Um, but this has been a wonderful night tonight. Uh, thank you so much for everyone to join us who joined us tonight. Uh, thank you, Chantel, for your wonderful recipe. I cannot wait to make it. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Chad, for joining us again. Uh, we hope that you will join us again at some point. Uh, oh, I see a question for Jerry from Jerry. Uh, any exercises specifically for knees that you recommend quickly? Oh, gracious, Jerry. Uh, do you have like three and a half hours and we can like have a panna cotta and talk about it? Um, yeah, there, I, there's so many exercises for knees. If I had to say one thing, strength. So if, if, you, if you do something to strengthen your quadricep muscle, the muscle in the front of your thigh, that's usually going to be the best bang for your buck. So, and there's thousands of exercises for that. So maybe Google simple exercises for quad strengthening and see what you come up with. Awesome. Uh, another one, wrist carpal tunnel syndrome, pinched ulcer, ulnar nerve, anything that you can recommend? 
Yeah, actually, the uh, so the wrist stuff, carpal tunnel stuff, carpal tunnel is median nerve, ulnar nerve. We've also got the radial nerve. Uh, those are the three big ones for the upper extremity. That first stretch that I showed, this one side bending with the rotation is a scalene stretch. And that actually opens up your brachial plexus, which then feeds into those three big nerves. So actually try that one that we just went through nice and gentle and see if that changes your symptoms. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, all these questions have been great. Thank you everyone for joining us again. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your night. Check out uh, more of Dr. Chad's YouTube or videos and exercises at, on these YouTube videos. Uh, and we hope that you will all join us again in future episodes of Global Healthy Lifestyle Events presenting Creaky Kitchen. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. Mm -hmm.